Hello there. Thanks for watching and I appreciate you. This is a video in a series of videos showing you how to make a custom character controller that uses rigid body physics, sim machine cameras, Unity's new input system, and custom player gravity. In this short video, I'll show you how to create the base project, install Unity's new input system, and create an input manager that accepts basic movement input. To get us started, we're going to open up Unity Hub by double clicking this conveniently located icon on my desktop. And once that launches, we're going to go ahead and create a new project. We're going to do a blank 3D project, and I'm just going to name it Create Project, and we'll wait for that to create. Once it creates, it will automatically launch. This process normally does take almost a minute, sometimes longer than a minute. All right, with our new project open, we're going to go ahead and go to Window, Package Manager, in the drop down where it says Packages and Project, we're going to click that and we're going to select Unity Registry. This will show us all the different packages that we can get. We're going to scroll down until we find Input System, and current version is 1.2.0, and we're going to go ahead and click Install. Again, this will take a minute. It will prompt you with this warning. You're going to want to go ahead and click Yes. That's going to cause Unity to restart and finish installing the new input system. All right, now that Unity's restarted, we can go ahead and close the package manager. If you want, you can scroll down first and verify that it did install the new Unity input system. You can verify with the check mark this package is installed. You can go ahead and close it. And now in the projects tab, on the bottom left corner, this is the default Unity view, by the way, well, mostly default. But in the bottom left corner, you're going to have a project tab. And if you don't, go ahead and find that and open it up. And our assets, we're going to go ahead and right click, create folder. And we'll call this folder scripts. Within the scripts folder, we're going to go ahead, create another folder. And we'll call this folder input. And within the input folder, we're going to right click again. And this time, we're going to, go to create. And all the way at the bottom, there's input actions. Go ahead and click that. I'm going to go ahead and call this input actions and hit enter. Now if we double click on this, it'll go ahead, it will launch the input actions window manager thing. That is the technical term for it. You can believe me because I have a very serious tone. And there's a lot going on here. So we'll start with no control schemes. If you click on that, you can add a control scheme. What a control scheme is, is you can basically set up a different control scheme for each different type of controller, whether it be a mouse or keyboard, a gamepad, joystick, so forth and so on. We're not going to worry about that. We're going to use the same control scheme for both our gamepad and our mouse and keyboard. So we're not going to add one. We're just going to use the default. Underneath that, we have this whole section dedicated to what they call action maps. What an action map is, you really don't have to worry about this too much because you can always come back and change the name, change what it does, you can change everything. So don't get hung up on this part, don't get you know stuck trying to figure out what to call it or anything. But to give you an idea of what an action map is, um, think about a map in your game and where you're at in it. Whether you're on land, if you're in the water, if you're in space, wherever you are, you might have different controls, which might require different actions, which might require a different action map. That's how I remember it. So for example, if I were to add one, I would call it humanoid land. It means I have feet and I'm walking and I'm on land. Oh, you could also have one for say humanoid water, which would be for swimming, etc. Or you could have one for even just the menu. Again, don't get too hung up on this. Start with your base one. And later on, you can always just duplicate that and modify it from there, which will probably be a lot easier. For now, I'm going to remove these and just leave the humanoid land. Now, with the humanoid land selected, we get the actions menu. You can see there's one generated by default. I'm just going to go ahead and remove that. You can just rename it if you like, but I'm just going to remove it. And with an empty actions menu, we can go ahead, right click, and click add action. And we're going to name this action move. And let's go ahead, create another action, right click. Add action, and we're going to call this one Look. Now if we click back on Move, under Action Type, we want a Value. Under Control Type, we want a Vector 2. Same thing with Look, Value, 
and vector2. Right now, we're not going to take the time to go over every possible option, value, button, pass-through, and all the different control types possible, as well as the interactions and the processors. That would take way too much time, and if you would like a more in-depth tour of the input system, let me know in the comments below, and maybe I'll put together a video about that. Now going back over to Actions, under Move, you can see it says no binding. We need to add two bindings for each action. Each binding will be for each controller. We're going to be doing a gamepad and a mouse and keyboard. So let's go ahead and add another binding for each action. Next to the move action, there's a plus sign. When you hover, it'll say add binding. Go ahead and click that. And for this one, we're going to click add up, down, left, right, composite. And we're going to rename that to WASD. Now for the first binding, let's go ahead and select that. For the path, go ahead and click. And we're going to go to gamepad, left stick. Now under WASD, you can leave these to their defaults, 2D vector and digital normalized. And now if you click on up, and for path, click that, and click listen, and then you're going to press the key that you want to assign this binding to. And for up, we want the W key. So I'm going to go ahead and press W. And I'm going to click W, keyboard. And we're going to do that for the other three keys as well. And now for the look action, we're going to go ahead and do the same thing, except we're going to add just a normal binding. And for the first binding, we're going to go to path. And right here is the right stick, but if you go back to the main menu with this little arrow, just make sure you're on your gamepad, right stick, and then for next binding, path, go back to the main menu, mouse, and we want the delta. Now since we're using the same binding for both the mouse and the gamepad, the inputs are going to be significantly different. To help balance that out, I found it easiest to just simply add a scale vector2 processor underneath the delta mouse binding. And we're going to change the default scale of 1 to 0 0.03 for both the x and the y. And once that's done, make sure you go ahead and click Save Asset up here. Anytime you make a change, you need to make sure you click Save Asset. You can tell it to autosave, but it usually autosaves when you don't want it to do, and the whole save process takes a few seconds, so it can become really annoying. I would just suggest you get into the habit of clicking Save Asset. And we can go ahead and close the Input Actions window, Menu, Browser, Thing. And with Input Actions selected, in the Inspector, you have this Generate C Sharp Class checkbox. You're going to want to click that, and click Apply. This is the only time you'll need to do this, because every time from here on out, if you make changes to the input actions, it'll automatically do this. And what it's done is it's generated this C-sharp class for us. And you can just ignore everything that's in here, unless you ever need to make a custom modification to it. But keep in mind, if you edit this, every time you edit the input actions manager, it's going to overwrite any changes you make in this file, because it's going to redo regenerate the entire file. So, for all intents and purposes, you should never have to touch that. And again, you can just come back here and open up input actions whenever you need to make a change. And again, make sure you click Save Asset. Alright, with that done, we can go ahead and in the input folder down here, we can right click, go to Create, C Sharp Script, left click, and we're going to call it Humanoid Land input. And we can go ahead and open that up in your preferred editor. And we can get rid of all its default stuff. We won't be needing any of that. And we can get rid of these usings. We don't need those, but we will add one for the input system. And now we're just going to hash out a few lines of code, and we'll go over them and explain them after we're done.
Okay, now with that all typed up, we can go over what we just did. So up top here, we have two variables. They're both public, which means anybody can access them. They can read the values. They store a vector2 value. They're called move input and look input. Again, anybody can get them, but we can only set them privately or here locally within the script. And then I'm a C programmer, so I like to initialize my variables to usually a, a null or a zero value. Um, it's old habits. I prefer it. To me, it just makes sense. I'm just saying, here's this variable. Here's what I want it to be initially. And it's just, I don't know, it's just a little more verbose, I guess. And then next, we have another variable of an input actions class, and we're calling it underscore input. And I did not initialize this one for some reason, so let's go ahead and do that. Again, you don't need to do this. It's unnecessary in C sharp. Okay. Next, we have the on enable function. So these are Unity functions. And when I'm using Unity functions, I like to list them out in the order of execution. If you're not familiar with the order of execution in Unity, you can see that here in the Unity documentation. Okay, so in the on enable function, we want to go ahead and create new input actions in our local input variable. And then with that assigned, we can then go ahead and take our humanoid land action map and enable it. Whenever you have an action map, you have to enable it before you can use it. And the way we're going to get input is we're going to subscribe to action input events. Um, actually, hang on a sec. It looks like I made some pretty bad mistakes down here. Yeah, definitely pretty bad. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. You know, this is just, it just goes to show you that people who stream programming especially, but making videos, but especially people who stream this stuff live, how how good they are at it. Because it's just, it takes your focus off the programming. And if you just can't do it naturally, it's just, it's it's incredible. It just takes your mind off it and you're prone to make mistakes like I did just here. But anyway, there are actually three different events that can be called. Let me actually go ahead and put this here for you. So this is the event that can get called. You have started performed and canceled. Uh, started gets called when the value passes a threshold value or it is in the triggered state. That's another thing that can happen. Like for example, let me just copy and paste this real quick for you and I will show you. So if this action, this input action is triggered, which means it passes a certain threshold value, which you can set elsewhere. It depends. You have dead zones, you have trigger threshold values, if you have an analog trigger, so forth, so on. But anyways, if it goes past that threshold value and is considered triggered, started is going to fire, as well as performed. They're going to fire at the same time. Started, however, will only fire once, when this first passes that threshold value, when it's first triggered. Performed will keep triggering every time the value that's being returned or passed changes. So for example, if you have a thumbstick and you're moving the thumbstick around, the value's not always going to be a 1 or a 0, it's going to be some value in between, right? Depending on how far you're pressing that thumbstick over or joystick or mouse or anything like that. So you want that update, that value to be constantly be updated and reported back to you. So when it comes to thumbsticks, mice, anything like that, you generally want to be listening to the performed event and not the start event. We don't need that one. And then the canceled event gets called when that threshold value goes back below whatever the threshold is set to or is no longer in the triggered state. Generally speaking, it's going to be a zero value. So that's going to return a vector 2.0 basically. Let me clean this back up. So we have the performed event and we are subscribing to it with plus equals. And then the event handler is going to be set move. And all that's saying is the event handler is this function right here. It's going to take that event. It's going to take the context of that event, which is basically the data that's being reported back via that event. It's going to take the context, it's going to read the value, which is going to be a vector2, and we're going to take that vector2 value, and we're going to store it in move input, which can then be publicly accessed. And same thing with look, exact same thing. I'm just going to take that context, read the value as a vector2, and store it in the variable look input. Now, there are a lot of different ways you can subscribe to an event and handle it. Uh, probably the most common way that I see people do it incorrectly is with a Lambda expression. And what that looks like is, I'll show you real quick. Let me just comment the out. And we'll just make this past the context and we'll use the Lambda operator. 
which is just the equals and the greater than sign. And then we're just gonna assign just like we are in the function, ctx.read value, read is the vector two, and it's a function. Oh, it didn't capitalize it for me. Telesense sometimes really something. But that right there, that is a anonymous function, they call it, via a lambda expression. And what's the problem is with this is even though you can technically unsubscribe from an event like this, it's not easy and it's unrecommended by Microsoft. And Microsoft, it's C Sharp is their language. So if they say in their documentation, which I'm going off memory here, but I'm pretty sure it's there. They say in their documentation, they should use an event handler and not an anonymous function. If you have to later unsubscribe from it, which we do need to unsubscribe from this, or else we're going to create a memory leak, then we should just not do this and we should use an event handler. Uh, just to drill this a little bit more, yeah, sure. What if you want to um, do more than just assign the value to move input? What if you want to set a Boolean value? Like, for example, say we have public bool move is pressed equals false. And, and we want to, right? Even if we try to make this look neat, it's just not going to look neat. Move in pressed equals true we're going to value back and we need to take this and canceled right we don't need to read this value anymore because we know what's going to be it's just going to be a vector two zero so why waste the resources we don't need this context we just know that out move as press is now going to be false but now look at it this code just went from two simple lines which can be easily unsubscribed from down here right with the minus equals to what is this 10 lines Whereas all we'd have to do at this point is just take those two lines and boom. We're actually going to use moves press later, so I'm going to leave these and just do that. My OCD is kicking in. Okay. Get rid of them. On comment and save it. It's just much better. It's a recommended way. It's just do it this way. Use an event handler. Don't use anonymous functions. Lambda expressions. They're useful, they can make things concise when they need to be, but more often than not, they're not necessary. So, and here they're not recommended, even by Microsoft themselves, so don't use them here. Use an event handler, aka a function. And now that I've finished my tangent, let's go on back to our project. It's gonna recompile. And now that it's done recompiling, we can just finish this up real quick. We're gonna go up here to the hierarchy, we're gonna right click, we're gonna create empty. Gonna create input handler. And then under the input handler, we're going to take our humanoid land input and we're going to drag and drop it and attach the script. Save our project. And that's it. We're done. That's basic input. It's hooked up. It's ready to go. In the next video, we're going to handle basic movement and looking. I tried to keep this video shorter. Uh, the input actions or just the new Unity input system in and of itself is very complex, very powerful. There's a lot to it. If you want more of a deep dive, let me know below in the comments. Give me a like, give me a subscribe, leave a comment, let me know. And I'll try to put a video together later if that's what you want. Um, it, it is a very powerful tool. I do like it better than the old system. It just takes a little getting used to. <laughs> that's for sure. And the documentation right now is pretty poor. They, they really need to rewrite it all. But yeah, thanks for watching. And I hope to see you then. If you're feeling generous, leave a comment down below. I want to read what you're thinking. Let me know if you have any questions or recommendations. I'd also appreciate it very much if you liked the video. And if you're feeling extra, extra generous, it'd blow my mind if you subscribe to the channel. Being new to this and putting these videos together takes a lot of time and effort. Thank you for any and all participation and support. I look forward to continuing this in the next one. See ya.